The Agents of E-Commerce Podcast. The Agents of E-Commerce Podcast. Hello and welcome to episode lucky 13 of the Agents of E-Commerce podcast. Thank you so much for joining in. Today we have Allison Cripps Ferguson, who's the principal consultant of loyalty and activation with Merkel. We have a great conversation here about COVID-19, loyalty, how brands are evolving their relationship with customers and the types of tools and technologies we can look forward to in the future of loyalty. So please enjoy and let me know what you think. Welcome, everyone, back to episode number 13 of the Agents of E-Commerce podcast. I have a special episode today. I'm with Allison Cripps Ferguson, who's a principal consultant with Loyalty and Activation from Merkel. Say hello, Allison. Hi, everyone. So nice to be here with you today. Awesome. So Allison and I go back to our days at Accenture. When I connected with her, I think over some opportunities, might have been with Synchrony or a number of different mm. financial services firms, but, but she impressed me back then and she's definitely done a lot of great things since. Uh, but why don't you tell us a little about your background, Allison, and, and how you got into loyalty? Hey, yeah, sure, Eric. Again, thanks for having me today. I've actually uh, been in loyalty before loyalty was cool, as they say, um, really came about it early in my uh, career in Atlanta at the uh, Intercontinental Hotels Group. Um, a great company with a lot of brands. And I was, uh, you know, joined pretty soon out of um, my college degree in economics. I had planned to uh, work at the Federal Reserve Bank and uh, be an economist and found marketing um, more interesting and perhaps better paying. So I started my career early there as a database marketer and a marketing analyst uh, for IHG's Priority Club. So really started in the trenches of working with with data and understanding uh, different uh, c- customers and guests and their behaviors and, and, and how they interacted with the brands and with loyalty and uh, really just was hooked. So throughout my career, I've sort of um, grown as a loyalty practitioner across, you know, uh, starting as an analyst, but, you know, quickly getting into to strategy, having, you know, led loyalty uh, later at leading hotels of the world in New York City, um, got into global loyalty, and then really found a passion uh, for consulting uh, with Epsilon, Visa, Accenture, and Merkel, making up my career as a loyalty consultant. So um, it's been a great uh, 20-year-plus ride and largely focused in loyalty. Awesome. Yeah, definitely. You have an extensive experience and we're hoping to, to, to pick your brain a bit today on, on how loyalty, is, loyalty has evolved, particularly with, with COVID. Uh, it's interesting, you know, the timing of this. Merkel, your current company, just came out with a point of view, their 2020 loyalty barometer, mm-hmm. which has some really interesting insights about uh, a perspective where they've done some surveying and, and have compared year to year the evolution of how loyalty has evolved with their clients. So we'll probably hit some of those topics and points as we go. But uh, if there's anything you want to say about that. Yeah. I mean, the loyalty barometer is one of our um, landmark pieces that we do each year at Merkel. Um, I think uh, starting in uh, 2017, really seeking to take, you know, the pulse of consumers as, uh, you know, newer generations with a bit different preferences in terms of both the economic and uh, sort of social and emotional uh, elements they're seeking from brands in order to create that that connection uh, and loyalty on a deeper level than just uh, an economic uh, definition. You know, we've been looking at different segments, different elements of loyalty, value propositions, and activation um, experiences, and really trying to best understand the pulse of the consumer uh, to better serve our, our, our growing client base at Merkel. Yes, definitely. So let's start with the consumer because that's a, that's a great way to place to start. Uh, what have you noticed or seen in today's consumer that's evolved or required changes in approaches to loyalty? Yeah, I mean that's a great question. I mean specifically, you know, this is a a, a tough year, right? I mean, it's a tough year on, on a lot of levels and kind of steering away from 
you know, the sort of tragedy of it all. It's really been a, a year of different experiences happening uh, for brands as they interact uh, with consumers across a number, you know, of, of fronts. So if we're focused kind of on uh, you know, COVID and and hopefully soon emerging from COVID, um, you know, we're seeing consumers on one hand uh, really seeking out um, an economic value proposition that's pretty uh, direct and and valuable to them as as ever, um, but they're also beginning uh, to give us signals um, that they're choosing which brands they want to do business with um, based on things like uh, gratitude and like-minded values and uh, and thankfulness and things of that nature. So while we would always expect that loyalty strategies and programs would have some level of economic value, uh, we're also seeing um, indicators that consumers are being more um, open in the brands that they'll do business with, of course, because of the digital frontier and time at home during COVID uh, leading to more browsing behavior. But they're also looking for brands uh, that not only meet their needs and offer a good value proposition, um, but also brands that um, care about diversity, that uh, say thank you to their customers, and also those that perhaps share similar values. Yeah, the the the, no, the focus on values is is always been there, but it just appears to be a real serious consideration of consumers nowadays that their brands that they do business with align to their political and maybe social uh, philosophies. Yeah, I think that's right. And some loyalty pioneers we might think of in the space, uh, such as I'll use REI as an example, uh, brands like REI or, or UGG, um, some brands we do business with and some we don't that I may speak about, but, um, you know, there, there've been these kind of classic kind of brands that are all about community and, and the values of sustainability or, um, outdoor, uh, healthfulness or, or what have you, or, or even stronger beliefs such as Nike, um, that, that really were kind of trailblazers in this idea of identifying with a brand on a deeper social level, I think that's becoming more prevalent, although a brand doesn't have to be, of course, uh, political to earn earn loyalty, but a lot of brands are seeking to really create a deeper meaning and connection in consumers' lives. Definitely. And I think companies like REI, as you mentioned, uh, are out there in the forefront of, of committing to social causes. I think mm-hmm. you know, I saw a recent statistic uh, that seventy one percent of consumers say they they will lose trust in the brand if if they perceive that it puts profits above people. So it's not only about what they believe in, but their their actual business practices as well. Yeah, and it's interesting as marketers uh, to 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 reflect on how that can impact not only our messaging, which is you know bringing forth the things we're doing to support um, people in our companies and. Uh, give back into uh, a responsible uh, community giving and social responsibility, but also how do we uh, look forward in our value propositions and the sort of uh, programmatic offerings we put in front of consumers in a way that allows them to participate in those activities um, and show that uh, we're not only giving them value, but we're caring about the people who we employ or that are in our community um, in a bigger way. I mean, Chobani is yet another example of a brand we admire at Merkel and uh, certainly a very shining example of a, a future vision of not only the a new CEO, but a new kind of way of thinking about uh, business and community. Definitely. And I think, you know, you, you mentioned some of the brands that you think are doing it right. Um, you know, who else do you think is, is making the, the right moves right now in this moment? Yeah, I mean, we've become students of brands, you know, on a on a daily basis during during COVID and, and other times, and really noting a lot of brands that are kind of um, not just doing benevolent things, but are kind of adjusting and re and repositioning um, through loyalty during this time. I mean, an example, uh, the couple that come to mind is you know programs that are 
adjusting to the reality of people's ability to to spend and engage. I mean, the biggest example, of course, would be uh, travel companies like um, Marriott or or Delta. I just heard yesterday that um, Delta waived all of its change fees permanently, um, which is just really solving a dissatisfier consumers have had for a long time. But they've also, as a I admit, as a Platinum Delta member, was delighted to know that my status is extended through the end of 2021. Um, certainly with Bonvoy, it's a similar situation, and I'm, and other brands are doing this as well, is really thinking more generously about um, the fact that I can't travel right now, I'm not traveling right now, and certainly not wanting to uh, cause me any uh, loss in my status or uh, relationship with them at this time. Um, so I think those are kind of the transactional uh, ways that brands are responding Um Brands like Macy's are also doing things like that, such as extending their uh, star rewards to have um, longer utilization periods and also issuing them in a more convenient way for people to use and and actually promoting the use of um, rewards, which not a lot of brands tend to do um, because they're eager for people to to earn points, but not always eager for them to use them if you – uh, follow me there. Um, mm-hmm. And then I think there's brands that are just doing um, heartfelt things and and respecting how people are spending their time. I think Eddie Bauer comes to mind, you know, did a sort of activation campaign around spending the night under the stars in your Eddie Bauer sleeping bag or something similar and, and really trying to connect and have people share stories back with them through hashtag campaigns and things of that nature, which I talked about in a, a recent um, retail uh, article from Merkel, um, you know, just really asking people how they're doing, asking people to share an experience they're having during COVID. And while that seems uh, difficult and a large brand to do with many people, uh, you know, new technologies such as uh, people sharing via hashtag and different channels can get really personal at scale, which we think is obviously um, has a good overall impact on the brand. Definitely. And it seems also that, as you mentioned, policies need to evolve for the times. You mentioned travel, Delta. I know American Airlines as well are waiving the change fees. Uh, what other areas from a policy standpoint do you think uh, who what may have never thought of in the past are becoming critically important to brands and consumers? Yeah, I think that if um, we're thinking about, you know, kind of policy, if you will, certainly things like privacy um, and and how we're using uh, data is becoming more sensitive. I think in our loyalty barometer report, uh, we saw in in all cases in terms of people's willingness to share data uh, with with brands in exchange for rewards has gone down across the board. Um, so I think, you know, people may end up, uh, being more, more selective about brands that they use and what they share in, in the future, or else obviously the other direction might be that we have to pay a higher bounty for, for data and loyalty, of course, has always been around identity and data collection and, and identifying ways to get to know and interact with consumers outside of a transactional moment and, um, Frankly, we believe that that's even more true uh, now, not only during um, COVID and having a trusted relationship, but also um, because of, you know, the demise of the cookie and the, the wide held belief that sort of anonymized identification will, will be out of uh, fashion as, as deeper privacy laws move, move towards us uh, from California <laughs> to the East, I suppose. So I think that you know, that's something that, that we're all thinking about as well as new new generations of consumers that are increasing in their number, you know, with Gen uh, YZ being over 50% of the population and certainly growing uh, in their consumer power is really that's that these consumers um, may have different preferences and may want to interact differently and certainly um, keeping a pulse on uh, newer generations of consumers coming into loyalty programs will likely ask more of us in terms of not only the value proposition, but the, 
the ways in which we interact digitally and the speed at which we interact digitally, which, as you know, is a whole other element of um, bringing loyalty to market. Definitely. And the, the expectations of those those new consumers are are really shifting, I think, the focus to brands and, and how they engage. Definitely. Yeah. So so let's talk. So we've talked about some of the folks that are doing it right. Um, you know, who, who in your mind is is has not seized this moment, so to speak, and, and, and are not as effective as they maybe they could be? Yeah, I mean, I, I think rather than I may not mention specific brands, just uh, to, you know, in respect of my, it's really just my opinion. But I think some things that brands are doing that, that we're finding uh, falling flat is. I guess one thing would be, Eric, is just continuing to do the same thing um, or pushing on uh, offers in market or or pushing on elements that just aren't going to resonate right now. So if I think of another airline, I think Delta's done a good job. I think another airline that I've observed did did maybe less of a good job in that um, we noticed that they kept uh, sending out offers to purchase miles um, during this time, and it seemed more motivated by the airline and their need to offload uh, miles or keep the miles moving, so to speak, and um, really just seemed a little off color uh, to us as a promotional um, move. So I think that um, probably fell a little flat with us or brands that we've seen that some that we work with and some that we just kind of study who really seem not to know what to do uh, at all and um, kind of are tra- trailing trailing behind and perhaps don't have the infrastructure um, to move that quickly and um, sort of change policies or change uh, direction nimbly. I think some, some brands and teams were out there just waiting, uh, hoping it would go by uh, quickly and um, kind of retreating, if you will. And, you know, what we've heard from consumers and studies that we've read, um, Global Web Index comes to mind as a great source, is, you know, people have more time on their hands. They want to know what's going on, and they actually want more communication and interaction now with brands than they did before. So kind of keeping back in the shadows is is perhaps not a losing, uh, not a winning proposition. Um, I think the other thing uh, that we've sort of been advising some of our brands on around activation and, and CRM really is if if you have more site visitors, which many of our clients do, because the traffic that they do have is shifted from in-store to online, but also because there's a lot more people checking out new sites and new retailers, uh, for example, than they have in the past due to COVID, and that may be just due to curiosity, boredom. It could be due to supply chain issues or what have you. But um, if you have people visiting your site during this time and you're not asking uh, to start a relationship with them through a loyalty membership invitation with a, an incentive uh, to stimulate that first purchase, then then I really believe that's a missed opportunity not only to um, – close the sale, so to speak, but to, to expand um, acquisition and use a loyalty program to acquire in a time of higher traffic. So we've been leaning in a lot on that advice is really understand what's going on on your site. If you're bringing in new consumers, try to convert them into a known relationship and gather personal data and build a, da- a personal graph around your your new uh, visitors, but also your uh, your existing member base. People's lives have changed. Their preferences may have changed. Their economic position may have changed. And while that's maybe a more indirect path to gather information, um, you know, letting people uh, share where they are in their lives is important as well. Definitely, and I think you know you mentioned this the sensitivities, particularly around COVID. Uh, for brands that they need to de- need to be aware of what what their customers are going through, they have to be uh, empathetic in many ways. I, I saw another survey. I was the 2020 Edelman Trust Barometer uh, around brands, and and they found that uh, I believe a, th- 
that 33%, a third of brand uh, folks said that they've convinced other people to stop using a brand mm-hmm. that they felt was not acting appropriately in response to the pandemic. I mean, that's, that's a huge uh, potential swing of very uh, vocal consumer dissatisfaction, trying to push people away from brands. So that's, that's, that's the risk by not appropriately responding here. Uh, yeah, to be sure, and I think as you as you know, Eric, from uh, your own experience, we we have forums that exist in different industries, largely built off loyalty uh, platforms of users. Like Points Guy comes to mind, and and others around the the financial services space and and credit card offerings and things of that nature. But certainly, any kind of um, there's a lot of communities out there that share uh, reviews at the very least, but also. Um, dissatisfaction about brands and their actions or experiences with with others, and that can be devastating. And certainly on the flip side, when we can use loyalty strategy and loyalty programs to create a positive environment um, and where we're doing things that people do like and then responding in a two-way conversation when people uh, don't like and, and addressing um, a dissatisfaction, the Delta example comes to mind, finally about change fees. I mean, I personally have been dissatisfied about that for a very long time, having someone who travels 30, 40 times a year normally, that can really add up as an expense for our company and clients um, as well. So I think, um, you know, building those communities and creating a forum of open, uh, probably a monitored forum, but for people to to exchange uh, their stories, to exchange their uh, feelings, and hopefully to find a community of advocates and, and and thank them, offer them a reward or a special recognition um, as an advocate um, or an ambassador, if you will, um, is is a great strategy uh, in these times. Definitely. So let's take a bit of a shift here and look look forward. We've been focusing on the now and and what's gotten us here, but obviously, you know, the hopefully the the. The pandemic will will find an endpoint, but even regardless, what are some of the things that you're looking forward to regarding uh, uh, the future of loyalty and where you see uh, companies betting right now? Yeah, I mean, we like to think about where loyalty is going, right? I mean, we uh, formed Merkle Loyalty from a combination of, um, as you know, 500 friends, which was sort of a a new SaaS platform some years ago from the Bay Area with uh, kind of Merkel's uh, sort of well-regarded customer strategy and consulting frameworks. And you'll find a lot of us at Merkel Loyalty are, you know, consultants by trade. Um, But then we have a whole arm around um, consumer activation and and sort of promotional activity and um, sort of – market stimulating activities like uh, sweepstakes, chances to win, um, engagement hubs and content portals. So we bring a lot of tools to that. So how we can utilize those things and shape them going forward is of extreme importance to our our growth. I mean, I think we, we see loyalty um, in an age of identity right now, as I mentioned, um, again, with kind of the demise of uh, third-party identification and really leveraging uh, loyalty to establish a known relationship, to use activations to go out and market with media and find new uh, and existing consumers and draw them in uh, to a loyalty experience and get and acquire their their name and then create more moments to engage them across uh, not only um, you know transactional moments but other moments as well in their life cycle and uh, cr- create more ways to participate and gather the data and then really use analytics to, you know, understand relationships and value them differently. And I think this has long been the promise of an integrated big L value proposition, if if you will. But we're finding a lot of our work these days is companies challenging us in the context of digital transformation to really bring all those tools together in a single sort of strategic value proposition uh, for them. So so that's been a big shift from, you know, designing a, you know, kind of two-dimensional loyalty program to really integrating into digital transformation strategies as the driver of identity and personalization. Um, so I think that's been a big change. And then, you know, kind of looking forward, 
Um, you know, we see brands, uh, winning brands, uh, really building meaningful partnerships uh, with one another um, for consumers, finding ways to increase ability to earn rewards quickly and really bring utility back to loyalty programs. Um, but also uh, an area that I'm particularly interested in is how can merchants and retailers uh, collaborate better in a channel, sort of channel-friendly strategies um, across um, those same kind of topics because um, we still see retailers and manufacturers kind of arms crossed staring, you know, at each other. And meanwhile, uh, brands like Amazon are, you know, constantly innovating around bringing, bringing merchants to the forefront, building portals within their site for merchants and, um, you know, creating experiences for merchants as a service and really we believe a more collaborative environment between retailers and merchants will be critical uh, going forward. And loyalty has a big role to play in, in how incentives can be uh, done more efficiently and profitably there. Um, I guess in the future, 10 years out, I mean, who's to say, um, but I think, you know, we talk a bit about headless technology and loyalty in the future, um, the ability to experience, a loyalty value proposition outside of the confines of a specific brand's uh, site or app um, through different devices and sort of a distributed value proposition. Uh, that's getting a little um, pie in the sky, I guess, but it's something we we think about as a, as a team um, to really push ourselves for innovation to think how uh, brands could interact with consumers in the future. Definitely. I think, you know, with innovation and the technologies that exist today, um, where, where are some other areas you see brands looking to explore, explore when it comes to new technologies and loyalty? Yeah, I think with loyalty, uh, you know, we, we talk about a little bit about the moment of, of truth is kind of a dated concept, but, you know, we talk a little bit about the moment of commerce and are talking with brands here and there about, how loyalty can become uh, more connected to the point of payment um, to bring offers more to the point of decision in that sense and activate as close to a decision as, as possible. So while we want the value proposition to spread across more moments of um, creating a relationship, gathering data, participating in uh, product trials or reviews, um, Referring others, um, you know, like these sort of non-transactional engagement activities we want to put within the, the wall of the loyalty program uh, experience. We also want to uh, create more value in things like currency by making it more fungible at, at the time of purchase, more able to be utilized because we found in our loyalty barometer report just year over year that the number one dissatisfier and turnoff for loyalty programs um, is that it takes too long or it's too hard to, to get a reward. Um, so a, a reward uh, to today's consumers should be something transparent, consumable, and, and portable, really. Um, and, and there's some distance to go uh, to kind of get to that, that level. And as I mentioned before, I think brands just – you know, figuring out how to bring all this together is kind of challenging, meaning, you know, I have my media budget, I have offers and discounts, I have loyalty, and um, there's a lot of disparate sort of uh, promotional and uh, strategic initiatives around the customer are kind of chaotic. Um, and I think brands are still working to orchestrate and optimize the how they bring value to each relationship in a way that, that yields the most uh, value exchange, hopefully for the brand and consumer alike. I still think that's hard for brands to figure out and uh, certainly something we spend a lot of time on. Definitely. And there's, I'm sure there's lots of roadblocks and bottlenecks in that process, whether it's technology or data or strategy. You know, all of it has to come together pretty cohesively to execute uh, programs like that. Yeah, I mean, the factors you mentioned are pretty critical in terms of having a sort of customer 
driven strategy, and that's kind of simple to say. I mean, I think of a project that we worked on um, recently where, you know, loyalty was kind of a, a swim lane, if you will, along with things that you wouldn't necessarily find those loyalty paired with, like content and media and uh, promotions. And, you know, the companies are very eager to uh, have a strategy that that brings those together, but with orchestrated technologies like loyalty platforms, along with their marketing clouds and uh, their CDPs or other sort of centralized identity platforms, you know, creating kind of a, a unified uh, market texture. Uh, but then there's the organizational element, which is how do we all operate as a team? Like how do we how do we collaborate? Uh, for with on resourcing and not not compete on resourcing and again this is kind of the you know the the north star vision that you never never quite reach but how do we make progress in in collaborative strategy in the benefit of you know the customer and the brand instead of um you know competing for resources so i think organizational models will have to continue to adapt, including those lines between, say, uh, loyalty and digital or loyalty and CRM, you know, those are those are disciplines that can't really be separated these days. But sometimes they, uh, and often probably they still are. Definitely, and and with throw on top of that, you know, the the current problem where folks aren't co-located anymore, and so you have the whole communication challenge on top of everything else when you're trying to execute. Uh, as well. Yeah, I mean, we've certainly been thinking about that too as we work with clients on large scale, high impact engagements within their organization. We've been uh, toying with the idea of, you know, what we're calling always on collaboration with our clients, which is, you know, the way consulting works, as you already know, Eric, sometimes as we go and we drop in on site and we gather our, <laughs> you know, data and information and we go off in our pods or what have you and and come back later with an answer but i think you know in in a distant uh you know remote uh distributed work environment i guess you could call it um we all have to think about ways to collaborate in real time meaning uh you know collaborating on work while in progress and it's like agile usually refers to things more on the technical side it's like how do we collaborate on marketing in sprints or strategy in sprints and it's uh, a, a different way of thinking but it's it's something that we're trying and uh it's messy but it's exciting at the same time definitely yeah that, i totally agree i think uh, this this current state is going to co- require a shake-up and companies that can respond and, and look ahead are going to have a, a real advantage both in how they collaborate with clients and customers as well as how they you know win against their competitors so yeah for sure well, well, Allison, this has been awesome. I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to, to have this conversation. Um, where can folks find you if they want to reach out and uh, get in touch? Oh, thanks. Yeah, I mean, we're certainly uh, always glad to hear from anyone in the market here at Merkel. Uh, my personal uh, contact information is acrips at merkelinc.com. Uh, you can also check out uh, Merkel, uh, our site, and go to our loyalty channel on our site and read a lot about uh, the perspectives I've talked about here, see some of our work. Um, and like I said, I just recently published in Retail Wire, so you can uh, check out the article there. We'd always uh, love to share our loyalty barometer report, so anyone can just reach out to me directly or to Merkel, and we'll get that to them right away. I um, really think what you're doing here is great, Eric, and really appreciate you having me as your thirteenth guest, I'll take that as a lucky number. Yeah, right. We're not like we're not like hotels where we skip the number thirteen, which I never, <laughs> I never. Maybe you can explain that to me, but I still think that's the weirdest thing. Yes, it's ever. the thirteenth floor, no matter what you call it, if you're a logical sort, right? <laughs> I know, right? It's like the, <laughs> it just disturbs me. Hey, well, thank you very much, Allison, and uh, we'll be looking to talk to you folks in the future. Thanks, Eric. Be well until then. <laughs>